So uh, today we have just two speakers and both Margaret Ellen and Anna are going to be introducing sets of problems, introducing a research area to you. They might not get into a lot of depth or give a lot of background. What they're trying to do is draw you into a problem session for much more in-depth discussion after the two talks. And so uh, they've decided how to deliver that. And I trust them. They're going to do a great job. Uh, and our first speaker is uh, Margaret Ellen Messenger uh, from Mount Allison University. She's the Obed Edmund Smith Chair in Mathematics, but now she's also department head of the, um, in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Mount Allison. Uh, she completed her PhD at Dalhousie under the supervision of uh, Richard Nowakowski, like so many of the uh, Games on Graphs people in Canada. There's a very strong, rich community in Eastern Canada in particular uh, for these researchers. And Margaret Ellen in particular has been very productive, publishing dozen, dozens of papers on pursuit in graph theory, uh, graph transverse, traversal or graph cleaning. She'll have to tell us what graph cleaning means and dominating sets and, and, and similar types of problems in graph theory. Uh, she's been a recipient of several NSERC awards and um, many, many grants, internal funding, regional funding, ARMS, uh, USRA is Canada's version of the REU. And uh, Margaret Ellen has received several of these USRA awards and supervised students. And, um, and she was also a mentor to Aaron. So uh, we're really, really happy to have Margaret Ellen with us today and I'll hand it over to her. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, thank, yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, so I'm at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick. So about a three hour drive east of Calais, Maine. Um, and as, as Bill said, I, I, I did my PhD with Richard Nowakowski long ago. And for those who, who are familiar with graph searching, they'll probably know that name. Um, and he really um, fostered a really collaborative environment for graduate students and postdocs um, where people were really open about sharing ideas. And so I grew up I grew up mathematically in that sort of environment. And, uh, and, and I, I love collaborating with people. Um, and so what I thought of, uh, I would do today is share a couple of problems that um, are, are new, ver new variants of, of some known problems. And I, you know, if, if it spurs someone to do some research in an area, whether you end up publishing or not, um, then I'll, I'll, I'll view this talk as a success. And if anybody does sort of, you know, um, run with things and, and publish something, I'd love to hear about it on the road. <laughs> so, um, Graph searching and protection models, uh, I think, are a great topic for this sort of session because they're they're very accessible when you when you frame problems as games. Um, so we're we're going to play some games on graphs. Um, the motivations come from all over science. Um, so, for example, if you know the node search number of a graph, that means you know the path width of a graph. And in theoretical theoretical computer science, this is very useful because problems that are very difficult computationally are often have um, polynomial time algorithms if, they're, uh, if they have bounded path width. So there are all kinds of motivations for these types of problems. So um, as Bill mentioned, uh, the, uh, my former postdoc, Aaron, uh, who's now at Concordia in Montreal, is going to co-facilitate or co-host the problem session later. And, uh, and so I'm going to talk today primarily about two problems and a little bit about a third one that um, lead into the problem session. So the first one is um, a cops and robbers type problem. So this is a game on a graph. It was introduced over 40 years ago where you have cops uh, you know, trying to capture an intruder on a network. So um, the original model, cops chasing a robber around a network, the cops could see the location of the robber at all times. The robber could see the location of the cops at all times. That, that's sort of the, the standard model. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on it. There's even a whole book written about uh, the cops and robbers problem. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, several people have looked at what if the cops can't see the robber? The robbers may be invisible, um, but you know if they run into the robber or land on the vertex occupied by the robber, they could catch the robber. So those are the two ends of the spectrum. You know, the cops can see the robber at all times, the cops can never see the robber. So uh, with a large group of people, um, a few years ago now, uh, we looked at you know, everything in between. Um, so what if the cops can only see the robber if the robber's fairly close to them? So this seems quite reasonable, I think. 
So if you haven't seen Cops and Robbers games before, we'll, we'll play a game in a second. Uh, you know, it's a fun little game. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, accessible if you've, if you've never seen this kind of problem before and, and hopefully you'll uh, consider joining us in the problem session. So cops are initially placed on some vertices of a graph. Then the robber chooses a vertex to start. At each step, cops move, then the robber moves. The robber can always see the location of the cops. The cops know where all the other cops are. So maybe the cops all have walkie talkies and they can radio each other. So they know where they're, where they're located. They can coordinate a strategy and maybe the volume is turned up too loud and the robber hears all this. <laughs> so the idea though here is the cops can only see the location of the robber if they're within distance L. So if, the, if, the, if there's one cop within distance L of the robber, that cop sees the robber, you know, radios their buddies and says, I know where the robber is, the robber's here. So this is the model we looked at. And we have a couple of graph parameters associated with this. Um, C sub L of G is the minimum number of cops you need to, to guarantee capture of the robber. And so that means a cop lands on the vertex occupied by the robber. And this is a deterministic uh, model, not, not probabilistic. Um, and we're gonna, you know, capture needs to happen in, in finite time. We'll also, uh, there's another parameter um, with a prime, the cops need to locate the robber. So that means either seeing the robber or knowing where the robber is. So let's, let's play the game. And so let's say um, I want to look at L equals two. So maybe I want to find C sub two of G. So I'm going to say my cop has distance two visibility. The cop can see two steps away. And if I'm smart, I might put the cop at V4, for example. But the cop, this is a diameter two graph. It's a very small graph. The cop can see every vertex. Every vertex is within distance two. So it doesn't matter where this robber starts the cop will, will see the robber. If the robber doesn't want to be captured, and we'll assume both players do play optimally, the robber will start over at V6. Otherwise, the robber is adjacent to the cop, and in the first move, the cop lands on the robber and wins. But the cop can see the robber. Um, a good first move for the cop would be to move to, let's say, V5. So cop moves over to V5, and now the robber moves well, the robber could move up to V1 or down to V2. Uh, let's suppose the robber moves up to V1. Otherwise, the robber will be caught in the next round. That's why they move to V1 or V2. And now the, uh, the cop moves. And a good move for the cop would be to move up to V7. So a move, you just uh, move your token to a neighboring vertex. So it's the robber's turn to move. The robber could move to V3, V6, or remain at V1. So we generally think of this as a game played on a reflexive graph. So there's there's a loop at each vertex, but we don't draw the loop. Um, this just means the you know a player could could effectively pass. They just traverse the loop. So I mean for this talk, just think about that they can pass. It doesn't matter where the cop where the robber goes. The cop can capture the robber on the next move. All the the, the closed neighborhood of the robber is contained in, in the neighborhood of the, of the cop. So one cop will win. If we change the visibility, things change. And of course, I don't need to look at L bigger than two because if the cop can see further, well, it's only diameter two graphs, so uh, only one cop will be needed. If I look at C sub one of G now, so if I, a cop can only see distance one, so the cop can see if the robber's in their neighborhood on an adjacent vertex, but not otherwise. Let's play that game. And unfortunately, it won't let me erase while I'm in presentation mode, so I'll just draw with a different color. So this time, let's say the cop, again, starts at V4. The cop can see every vertex in the graph except for um, V6. Oh. Uh, sorry, there's a question in the chat, and I, I'm happy to respond to chat questions as we go. Uh, does C2 of G depend on the starting positions of the cops and the robbers? Excellent question. So the, so the idea is what the minimum number of cops needed to catch the robber. So um, yes, we're going to assume they play optimally if there's a good starting location for the cops. 
they can start there or they could just move there after. Um, and so this is over all possible strategies of the robber. We want to guarantee capture of the cops. So in C1, the, um, the cop uh, starts at V4. The robber doesn't want to be caught immediately, so the robber would start at V6 again. But now things are a little different. The cop can't see the robber, but the cop knows exactly where the robber is. There's only one vertex they can't see, so the robber's there. So the C1 prime in this case is, is one. But to capture the robber, well, the cop could move to V5 again. Let's try that. If the cop moves to V5, the robber to avoid capture will move up to V1 or down to V2. But the cop is not gonna know where the robber moved. So there's a question, what do we do? I mean, the cop could move to say V6 and then the robber moves to V3 or V4, but the cop's not gonna know which. Um, the cop could move up to say V7, but this is, a, a, again, this is not a probabilistic model. Luck is on the side of the robber. So if the cop has to make a guess, we'll assume the cop is gonna guess incorrectly. So if the cop moves up to V7, we'll assume the robber must've been down at V2 and then moves to V2 or, or V8. So this is not a proof, um, but, but when one cop's actually insufficient, it doesn't matter what the cop does. So I haven't proved that, but we actually did prove it in, the paper, in our paper for this exact graph because it's a very a good graph that illustrates a lot of different things. So you'll, you'll just have to take my word, cop number is two here. And of course we could look at C0 of G. If your cop can't see the robber unless they land on, a vertex, on the vertex occupied by the robber. Here, we need at least two cops because if they can see distance one, we need two. Um, it's easy to see three would work. If I had one cop, bouncing back and forth between V3 and V4. So just the whole game that cop moves from V3 then to V4, back and forth. Then the robber can never occupy either of those vertices. If I stick a second cop and have them bounce between V5 and V6, the robber can't move there, cuts the graph in two, and a third cop could, could then kind of walk through and, and capture the robber. So the cops would work. Um, and I think three are, uh, I think th we need three, I don't think two works offhand. Uh, so, so this is our, our, our L visibility cops and robbers game. It might look a little bit harder because now we have, well, L could be any number of things rather than just the cops can always see the robber or the cops could never see the robber. But we can actually say a lot about, uh, a, a lot about the cop number, the L visibility cop number. So I'm gonna, have, define one thing formally, a formal graph theory definition. Um, like it's sort of unavoidable. I wanna talk about this little theorem just because it leads into the problem in the problem session. It, it sort of it was the original motivator. A graph is chordal if it has a simplicial elimination ordering. So if you've seen chordal graphs before, you might've seen it through the definition where if you've got a cycle of length four or more, there's a chord. This is another way to define chordal graphs and very useful in this instance. So it's just an ordering of the vertices. If we have n vertices, we just order the vertices V1 through Vn, so that if you take a given vertex, its lower index neighbors are, are pairwise adjacent. So not every graph has a simplicial elimination ordering, but chordal graphs do. And we're gonna exploit that with our, uh, with our proof. So the, the proof of, of theorem 3.2 is just an inductive proof. If we have a chordal graph, then the number of cops you need to see the robber is equal to the number that you need to catch the robber. And actually, once one cop sees the robber, all the rest of the cops can have a nap. That's the cop that's gonna catch the robber. The rest of them aren't used uh, the, for the remainder of the game. So just as a sort of quick sketch of the idea, let's suppose um, we've got a cop on VI, and over here, distance L away on the X is the robber. 
So the cop and the, there's a cop distance L from the robber, and let's assume it's the robber's turn to move. If, if it was the cop's turn to move, the cop would move one closer, distance L plus one or L minus one away. And this is an inductive proof on L, so we'd be able to use the hypothesis. So we're at the point where the cop, this cop has seen the robber. Now my graph is chordal, so it has a simplicial elimination ordering. And that's how I've labeled my vertices. So either X is bigger than I or I is bigger than X. So without loss of generality, let's say I is bigger than X. The robber is at a higher index vertex than the cop. Well, if the robber can just keep increasing their index, then you know, their distance L apart, the robber moves, disappears because the robber's now distance L plus one away from this cop. And then the cop moves, another distance L, oh, now I see the robber again. And then the robber moves, poof, disappears, and the cop moves um, to see them again. So this happens whenever the robber, you know, keeps in increasing their index. So they just sort of like, it's almost like the cop sees the robber's previous position. So the cop sees where the robber is, and then the robber moves and disappears. If our graph is finite, and I didn't write that in the theorem statement, but it's we only considered finite graphs in our paper, then the, the robber can't always increase their index. You know, if it's a finite graph, eventually the robber will, you know, increase their index and then have to decrease it or, you know, be decreasing and then have to increase. So let's fast forward to that step and suppose the robber moves from Vx to Vy to Vz. Um, And well, so y is bigger than x, and y is bigger than z. So the robber is moving to a higher index and then a lower index vertex. Okay, if that's the case, we've got a chordal graph. We use the fact that it's chordal. If I take a given vertex like vy, its lower index neighbors are adjacent. So that means vx and vz are adjacent. So now we play the game, the robber moves to Vy, then the cop moves to some Vj, their distance L away now, and the robber moves again to Vz, and the cop moves to some Vk. And now, because the cop has a little shortcut, could you use that edge from Vx to Vz, their distance L minus one apart. So now we're at a situation, their distance L minus one apart, and it's the robber's turn to move. So because our graph is finite, you know, every time the robber is, you know, increasing their index and then decreasing, the cop gets one step closer, uh, or decreasing and then increasing, the cop, get one, cop gets one step closer, the cop will eventually catch the robber, um, or just using the inductive hypothesis, because it's an inductive proof on L. Okay. One question, one, one thing wasn't clear to me. So when the robber moves distance L plus one away, how do we know that the cop who can no longer see the robber knows how to get closer? Oh, sorry. Um, so the cop takes the shortest path to the robber's previous position. So the cop knows where the robber was. Um, so <laughs> I, we start up, so I just sort of drew up and didn't say, we just following that shortest path to the robber's previous position. Uh, but that's actually a good question because that's sort of key in this this idea of uh, this sort of new variant. So, if we think about you know the cop looking at okay the robbers here distance L away I know that shortest path and now the robber moves and disappears. Cop moves oh, I can see the robber again. It's really kind of like the cop always sees the previous position of the robber. It's just sort of like we're just keeping that distance um, distance L to L plus one. So this made me think of, well, what if your cops could only ever see the previous positions of the robber? So this is a totally new model, um, but it, it just seemed to fall out of the, the chordal proof. And at the time we were doing this, I, I was really fixated on this question of what if you played the game of cops and robbers and you changed the rules? The cops you know, see the locations of the cops, they have their radios, We'll let the robber know where the cop is, but the cops can only ever see where the robber's been, not where the robber is now. So you can think about this as 
the robbers leaving some trail of destruction in their wake, um, or maybe they stepped in paint, like my picture. Um, I, I sometimes think about it as the robbers dropping breadcrumbs, but I don't know why a robber would ever do that. Um, but this is the idea of maybe that maybe there's wet paint. You could see where the robbers been. Maybe they've knocked over trash cans or whatever. Um, and so you could see you see where they've been. Um, and so this is a this is a totally new variant, and I've been sitting on it for quite a while because I have a very long list of, of problems that I think are very interesting and never enough time. Uh, so this is a problem that I want to share in in the problem solving session. So Aaron and I will talk about this. We know very little about the problem, um, but you know it's low hanging fruit if you know if somebody is interested in working on this. You know I think at least an introductory paper. You know with finding this the sort of cop number for some classes of graphs is, you know, someone can easily do that. So that's one problem. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different kind of graph searching problem. And it's the firefighter problem. So this one's a little different. Now we've got a fire breaking out at a graph on a vertex of a graph, and you could think about it as fire or gossip, or disease spreading. Um, and this is a little similar if you've done something, anything with zero forcing, power domination, bootstrap percolation. It's a similar sort of flavor. You've got something spreading on a network. At each time step, you've got a firefighter that's going to protect some vertices, creating a, a firewall or a fire break. The fire can't pass through that. Or you could think about inoculating vertices against some disease that the, you know, the disease can't spread to or through the inoculated vertices. And when it's the fire's turn, the fire just spreads as much as it can from each burning vertex to all its unburned, unprotected neighbors. So the fire is mindless. Uh, and it's really about the strategy of the firefighter. What's the goal of the firefighter? There are multiple goals. Um, some people have looked at trying to find the maximum number of vertices that could be saved. If you just protect one vertex at each step, that's called the surviving rate of your graph. So if you look at over all possible initial locations of the fire, so all possible starting locations, um, we look at the, the surviving rate as that average number of vertices that you could protect, or sorry, that you could save from being burned. So that's our surviving rate. We'll do something a little different. Um, another kind of goal is, can you contain the fire? Which makes sense on an infinite graph. So I have an infinite grid um, on the side. And our goal there is just, can we contain the fire? We don't want the fire to spread forever. So let's do that um, with two protecting two vertices at each step. So my fire breaks out at the square. I protect two vertices. Makes sense to protect neighboring vertices. And then the fire spreads. I protect two more vertices, then the fire spreads from each burning vertex to all unprotected neighbors. We protect two, and I'll just sort of speed up. Fire just spreads mindlessly, and we protect two vertices at each step from the fire. And so you can see we're corralling the fire, and we're going to contain it. So yay, the firefighters contained the fire, and they did it fairly quickly. It was eight time steps. So this is this is fairly well known, um, an old result from Wang and Moeller. Um, Moeller was an undergraduate student, I think. On the infinite Cartesian grid, if you protect two vertices each step, you can contain the fire in eight steps. They also proved you can't do it in seven. And they proved if you protect one vertex at each step, you can't contain the fire at all. So I came along in 2003 when I started my master's and was looking at the firefighter problem. And I thought, well, two, two, you know, it seems almost overkill. You can contain the fire really quickly. One, you can't contain the fire at all. And actually you can only contain, you can only save about a quarter of the grid. Um, so what if we vary the number of vertices protected at each step? So that's what I thought about and eventually got around to publishing it in 2008. And I'm just going to provide you with the periodic sequence uh, of vertices you protect. So in the first time step, you protect two vertices, and then you protect two, then one, then two, then one, 
some number of times. So here I've got two X uh, and then plus one, the, the extra two at the beginning. So I've got a periodic sequence of length two X plus one. And so I won't go through the, any of that. So I'll simply say that if you follow that sequence of protecting vertices, you can contain the fire and the average number of vertices protected at each step is a little more than three halves. So it depends on, on that X. Of course, you have that bigger string of two, twos and ones, uh, you're, you'll be a little closer to three halves, but we need a little bit more. We need a sort of an extra boost of firefighting power every so often. We're trying to build this sort of according to corral the fire and you wanna contain it in all those cardinal directions and you need a little bit extra. Uh, independently, a couple of other people proved a very similar result that you needed a just over three halves as your average number of, of uh, vertices you protected each step. But they also showed you, you could not do it with fewer than an average of three over two. And then a little later, some folks showed that you couldn't contain a fire if you used, if the average number of vertices protected at each step was exactly three halves. Okay, so that's, that's the firefighter problem. But as I said, I mean, just a small, you know, just looking at infinite grids. Um, but as I said, if you just have one firefighter, they can't contain the fire on the infinite grid and they can only save about a quarter of the grid. So not very much. Um, so I thought about this a, a, a while ago now and I thought, well, what if we slow the fire down? What if we make the fire slower, but intelligent? Oh, yes, so in the chat, there's a question about, uh, yeah, any X would work. A larger X just makes that average closer to three halves. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. You repeat the sequence. You're gonna have to repeat the sequence, I think about six times, four or six times in order to actually contain the fire. Um, but yeah, you can vary X. So we can't do very much with one firefighter. So let's slow the fire down. So this is uh, another problem that we'll talk about in the, in the problem solving session. So at each time step, instead of letting the fire burn as much as it can, let's, let's slow it down. So we're gonna call the, the fire, it's now a player. We'll call it the pyro. And at each time step, our pyro is going to choose one of the burning vertices and spread from that vertex to all unprotected neighbors. So the fire is much slower now. So on the grid, for example, you could think about the fire spreading, you know, it might, it might be some sort of narrow bit. It's gonna spread along rather than just spreading everywhere. So can one firefighter now contain the fire on an infinite grid if, it's, if we play this pyro game? Um, it's a little similar to Angel and Devil with Angel of Power One, but a little bit different. Oh, sorry, there's a question from the chat from before. Yes, you're right. The number of repetitions doesn't depend on X. Um, I should have put down how many steps it was to contain the fire. I think you have six repetitions to contain the fire. Um, so our pyro game is another problem to explore in the problem solving session. So this is another thing I've, I've had a summer student with a, you know, a, uh, some undergraduate summer research funding a long time ago. And they worked, you know, he worked on it for a while and, and did some nice stuff, but we didn't quite do all the things I wanted to do. And I never got back to it. So I thought it was time to share this game. That I think is really an interesting idea um, with everyone else. So I feel like I'm racing through everything, but I want to talk about one more problem. <laughs> so as Bill said, you know, this is not in depth. It's sort of a, you know, try to give you a, an idea of these kinds of problems. Um, and then if you're interested, you could join the problem solving session. And even if you're not, we have a document with some questions um, just posted in there. If you feel like just grabbing that to look at, uh, that's, that's, and not coming to the session, that's okay too. So the last one, eternal domination. So this is another fun one. Uh, so this is the, the game of eternal domination. I was actually motivated by, um, I think Arkea and Fredrickson were the authors who, um, in a, a military operations research article did a retrospective graphical analysis of some events of history. And one of the things they looked at was, you know, the, 
at the decline of the Roman Empire, so this is Emperor Constantine's era, um, you know, there weren't enough legions to just put oodles of legions everywhere. And the Roman Empire, Empire was really big. So, you know, how do you place your legions strategically? So if there's an attack in Britain, for example, maybe there's a, a legion in Gaul that can kind of move and help. But you don't want to do that and leave Gaul, you know, defenseless. So where do you position the legions and how do you move them around um, was, was kind of the, the, what they were looking at. And so this morphed into a number of internal domination type problems and a whole big interesting area of research. Um, and again, there's a survey paper that Chip Klostermeyer and Kika Meinhardt wrote probably five years ago now um, that surveys all the different kind of models and, and uh, what, it, what has been what have been done to that date. So um, the idea here is we've got guards, those are our legions. They occupy the vertices of a dominating set of a graph. So every vertex is either has a guard on it or is next to a vert, you know, adjacent to a vertex with a guard. At each step, a vertex is attacked. And you think about the unguarded vert vertices being attacked. And the guards sitting at a dominating set have to move according to a set of rules to form a new dominating set that contains the attacked vertex. So you're kind of like you're moving a legion to the attacked vertex, but everybody else has to sort of shift because what if there's another attack? Because there is another attack, because an attack happens every step. So there's an infinite sequence of attacks and you have to be able to sort of pivot uh, to defend against all of them. So we need at least a dot that, you know, the minimum, the minimum cardinality of a dominating set. So the domination of a, uh, the graph would be a lower bound on the number of guards we need. I often need many, many, many more uh, guards than, than the domination number of a graph. And it's about trying to figure out uh, how many we, we need. And on some classes of graphs, this is fairly you know, easy. Other classes, it's difficult. I think it was like three papers before three by n grids were solved, uh, three, four. I think, I think four papers, um, people wrote four papers in order to sort of find that minimum number of guards you need to defend a three by n grid. So four by n is really easy. Three by n's were weirdly hard. Um, so there's some, some unusual things like that. Um, but we're gonna explore in the problem solving session, uh, the idea of eternal K domination. So instead of looking at dominating sets, we can think about K dominating sets um, again, a little bit of a, you know, generalization of the problem, um, instead of having to be, you know, adjacent to a vertex in your dominating set, you have to be within distance K of a vertex in the dominating set. So there's our, that's our, our third problem, um, which is kind of a, a three very different problems. Um, but they're all sort of fairly accessible and, and Fun, fun little games on graphs. So if you are familiar with graph searching problems, hopefully, you know, you've, you've learned a little bit about some new problems that you could explore. And if you don't, if you hadn't known anything about graph searching problems, now, now you hopefully do know a little and are hopefully a little bit interested. So, uh, oh, just a question in the chat. Can a guard only move to an adjacent vertex? Um, depends on the model. <laughs> there are a lot of different models. Some of them, uh, there's some where guards have to move where um, vertices with guards are attacked and you have to move off. It's a motivation from file migration. Um, but generally, yes, guards can, in the original model, guards can only move to an adjacent vertex. Sometimes there's other conditions about how many guards can move, but generally speaking, yes, a guard could move to an adjacent vertex. So I'm gonna stop there. I think I'm about, I'm about out of time. Um, and if you have questions, um, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can unmute ourselves to applaud if you like, or you can use an applaud button. So, Did you so introduce a, a variant in the problem where some cops are more nearsighted than others? Pardon me? Is there a variant where some cops are more nearsighted? Can the, can the visibility <laughs> distance depend on the cop? Um, no, but we do have a model that's called hyperopic cops and robbers which 
it's very silly, but it's this, it's the far sightedness and um, the cops can only see the robber if the robber's far away. <laughs> but you're, you, you know, you could look at that. I think it would be, if you varied how much they could see, I think it would be even harder, <laughs> but absolutely you could do that. Yeah, I wonder if the far-sighted model is somehow uh, uh, akin to the graph complement of the near-sighted model. <laughs> now then the traversing, the traversing rules would change if, if you use those edges. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so can you briefly describe for us what graph cleaning means? What, what, what are some examples of graph cleaning or motivations for graph cleaning problems? Oh, um, yeah, graph cleaning was another problem that I wanted to talk about and just I could talk a long time. Um, so graph cleaning is related to to searching. Um, and the idea is you have a graph that's that's dirty. The edges and vertices of the graph are dirty. There's some contaminant, maybe algae or zebra mussels that something that regenerates. And we place brushes on the on the graph. Um, and at each time step, um, if you've got at least as many brushes on a vertex as incident dirty edges, then that vertex, you could think about it like chip firing, it, it fires the br uh, one brush down each dirty edge, cleaning that edge. And brushes in the original model aren't allowed to traverse clean edges, they only traverse dirty edges. So it is a kind of a searching, like you could imagine there's like a poisonous gas in your system and it's a way to flush it out um, or to clean it out. Um, and generally we think about, you know, you clean the graph, then you recontaminate or your contaminant like zebra mussels just grow back and then you have to, where your, wherever your brushes ended, you want to then clean the graph again. And so you want to be able to just continually do this forever. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. What we want to do is, is uh, ask questions that clarify what's gone on. Um, but if you, you know, want to sort of immerse yourself in a problem, there's, there's going to be plenty of time in one hour to immerse yourself in these problems. But uh, how about immediate questions for clarification or, or comments? Uh, please, uh, please just speak up, unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, I, I I have plenty of questions, but um, uh, oh oh, Susanna Susama, I, I don't think I lost sound. Um, it, it, hopefully, everyone is is still with us. Um, but I, I have individual problems. Um, but so so things like tree width and path width, do these parameters uh, of graphs come up much when you, when you're trying to figure out uh, the the the, uh, the pursuit parameters for graphs? I think it depends on the problem. I mean, um, node searching, I think the node search of the number of the graph is the path width plus one, or is it, yeah, it's not equal. I think it's plus one. Um, so, so if you know one, you know the other. Um, and then there's, otherwise there's a lot of relationships. So some problems, there's close relationships to cut width or, you know, or tree width or path width. Um, but then others, there, there isn't much of a relationship. So for cops and robbers and tree width, um, there is is not a close relationship at all. <laughs> are there algorithmic issues? Uh, do people prove that some of these computations are NP hard? Some of these values are NP hard? Oh yes, um, so a lot of them are are NP hard. Uh, I think what's cops and robbers X time? I think <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Other questions. And firefighting, you know, the finding the maximum number of safe vertices on a graph in general, or if you look on bipartite graphs, it's NP hard. Um, yeah, they're all hard problems. They're easy to describe, but hard to solve. Yeah, uh, one of the ones that I seem to recall, maybe this is still open, Margaret Ellen, is, is uh, the question of whether a fire can be stopped with one firefighter on a hexagonal grid. I know that there was a group, I think, Pavel Pralat maybe, and uh, I can't remember who the co-authors were. And I know they showed that if you, you could kind of put it in a spiral pattern by protecting vertices and you could contain it. I don't know if anyone ever solved the hexagonal. I worked on that for quite a long time, trying to, <laughs> trying to solve that. Because if you just have one, 
I think if you need, um, if you get, if you protect one vertex at each time step, but maybe twice get an extra, you know, vertex to protect, you can totally contain the fire. I don't think it's been solved, but I also, I'm not sure. It might have been. <laughs> So in the firefighting, uh, problem, does the fire only started a single vertex, or can it start at some subset of the vertices? For this problem, it's a single vertex. But you could certainly ask about more in general. And uh, I have a continuous version of the firefighting problem that <clears throat> might interest some of you. Um, uh, it's called the blob. <laughs> and it's based on uh, a grade B science fiction movie that's been remade a couple of times. <laughs> I can see some nods that people have heard of or seen this movie. Um, it's a very simple question. Uh, um, a blob grows on the plane, starts off maybe as a unit disc, but it doesn't actually matter, and grows at unit rate in all directions. That can only be stopped by a special kind of fence that can be manufactured at rate lambda. And the question is, what is the threshold value of lambda which you can stop the blob and save the world? And uh, we know it's between one and two. Um, but, uh, and we have a conjecture about exactly what's the, the optimum way to stop the blob. And, certain kind of pattern, um, but uh, it's wide open. No graphs, just okay. blob in the plane. The blob. That, that should be the title of your paper, blob in the plane. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, in a, it's, it's in a paper called um, something like firefighting on geometric, on random geometric graphs. Is one of those bounds probabilistic? Um, no, this is a completely deterministic problem. Hmm. And uh, um, there is an algorithm which will stop the blob as long as the rate of fence building is greater than two. And there's a proof that rate one is not sufficient. Got it. And that, at the moment, that's all we have. Well, that's great. Okay, uh, before we uh, move on to the next talk, is there any more questions? Anyone else have a question or comment or blob? Um, <laughs> all right, well, let's thank Margaret Ellen one more time. And um, now, um, well, let's take a two minute break and then 